Let, let me say that there okay. are, even, even though those lives are so different, there are certain um, parallels in terms of where these two men have uh, mm. uh, come yeah. from. Um, because um, uh, Hamilton is an illegitimate uh, uh, orphaned uh, boy from the Caribbean, is um, painfully uh, aware of his uh, lack of status, is tremendously ambitious in terms of wanting to enter uh, into high society and into the political uh, world. He's an autodidact, he's constantly uh, improving himself, but he really is an outsider trying to fight his way uh, into the um, mm. inner you know, ranks of uh, society and government. Mm. George Washington's story, although he was born at a much higher uh, level, as I recall, his, his father had uh, 10,000, Enormous amount of acreage and mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and slaves, um, but Washington too was very self-conscious about what he referred to as his defective mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. He wants to enter the upper ranks of uh, Virginia uh, gentry, and so he was, in his way, as hard-charging and ambitious as mm -hmm. Hamilton was, and had a similar consciousness of being an outsider. Also, both of them, as young men, um, had an unusual capacity for befriending powerful older men who became their mentors and uh, uh, champions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think in this, we can talk about this when we come to the uh, to, to the show, because you, yeah. have you seen the show yet? No. Okay. This is actually very central to, yes. to, to the show because Lin-Manuel Miranda asked me, um, uh, would Washington have seen Hamilton as a younger version of himself? Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, their personalities were so unlike, but there was something about their situations that would mm -hmm. have seemed familiar to Washington. Now, um, Hamilton always said that their personalities could not have been more different. He used the word dispositions. He said our dispositions mm -hmm. could not have been more alike. But what we mean by uh, personality, I think, is what he meant by dispositions. Mm -hmm. And um, Hamilton was um, a brash and headstrong personality. He was very um, mercurial and uh, brilliant and very impulsive. Washington was the opposite. Mm -hmm. Washington was cautious, thorough, you know, slow, methodical in his um, approaches to, uh, to things, so that their personal style could not have been uh, more dissimilar. But these two men complement each other in a way that just feels uncannily uh, mm -hmm. right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, George Washington was a very smart man. I think that he was much, much smarter than people uh, realize, but he was not an original thinker either in terms of political theory or in statecraft. Washington could not have been one of the contributors to the Federalist Papers. Uh, Washington could not um, have uh, forged the provisions of the Constitution and could not have forged a lot of the policies of his administration. But what um, Washington had in abundance was judgment, which was often the very thing that Alexander Hamilton lacked. Mm. Uh, it was, mm. to my mind, George Washington had uh, what I would call a reactive genius, that many people noticed that when presented with a set of options, um, he um, had an amazing ability to latch on to the right one. He couldn't have generated a lot of those options himself. But because of his judgment, his patriotism, his character, he could mm. spot the right one. And he was a tremendous talent uh, uh, scout uh, and assembled around him so many of the great uh, figures of the, of the time. So mm. what we uh, see is that uh, during the years when um, Hamilton is operating under the direct tutelage of George Washington, um, whether during the Revolutionary War, at the Constitutional Convention or um, during uh, Washington's presidency, Hamilton goes from strength to strength at moments he mm. almost seems invincible. The second that he's no longer operating under George Washington's guidance, yeah. we see how fallible his judgment yeah. was and how self-destructive his behavior mm. could be. But Washington established a kind of set of uh, guidelines within which uh, mm. Hamilton uh, operated and yeah. managed to, this is taking nothing away from Hamilton to say this, but managed to get this extraordinary performance yeah. out of Hamilton uh, again and again and early mm. on recognized what an enormously 
uh, intelligent mm. uh, young man uh, he was. So I think this was really um, the most productive partnership of the early years of the Republic. Mm. The only one that uh, obviously can rival it would be uh, Madison and uh, Jefferson, but it's really um, uh, Washington and Hamilton who were setting the stage by having to win the revolution, mm. enact the Constitution, and create the federal government, and then Madison and Jefferson, you know, carry that into uh, mm. you know a second uh, a second phase of the uh, of, of the country. So I think that they just are an unbeatable team, and it's one of those cases in history where the um, the whole is worth more than the sum mm. of the uh, of, of the parts, and I think that um, if you try to, well, certainly if you picture Hamilton's career without Washington, um, uh, it would have been much more limited career. Mm. You know, when Washington died, Hamilton made the famous statement: uh, "Washington was an aegis that is a shield most mm. essential uh, to me." Um, mm. We can uh, more easily, I think, imagine um, Washington's career without Hamilton, mm. certainly in terms of the Revolutionary War and the Constitutional Convention. More difficult, though, I think, in terms of his presidency, because Hamilton's accomplishments as Treasury Secretary are so fundamental yeah. uh, to especially that first term in uh, office that it is difficult to imagine um, what Washington's first term would have looked like. And that was not a gap, I think, that either a Madison or a Jefferson mm. could have Supplied. Mm -hmm. Hamilton had a genius for for uh, statecraft, and you know Hamilton combined the political. Uh, you know, he was both a political theorist and um, a brilliant technocrat. Mm -hmm. uh, in that particular uh, combination, I mean, Madison was certainly um, his equal as a political theorist, or. Uh, Jefferson, but um, they didn't combine that uh, gift for yeah. uh, forging policies, creating um, governmental uh, institutions. I think that what happened was that um, their political vision of the country had been very much forged by their experience of um, uh, going through the war together. Mm. Uh, they um, watched, for instance, the uh, chaos of the Congress um, the, the war left both of them uh, with, I think, the same set of political beliefs, uh, which was the need for a strong and energetic central government, uh, the um, a skepticism about legislative leadership and a faith in executive mm -hmm. uh, leadership, and in a, a sense that our government has to not only be strong and energetic, but flexible in terms of meeting the needs of the country. They also, um, one very strong bond between them uh, was that uh, both of them uh, felt that historically uh, one of the dangers of revolutions was that they tended to uh, run off to extremes. So it was a question, how do you kind of begin to turn off the fervor of the Revolutionary War without losing that idealism. In other words, how do you kind of move this into a more pragmatic mm -hmm. mode? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and when they saw things like Shays' Rebellion, uh, when they saw states squabbling between each other, uh, both of them had um, were fearful of um, anarchy, mm. fearful of um, mob rule. Both of them had a I'm wary of human nature is the way that I would mm. Um, mm. Uh, uh, say mm. it, uh, and you know this comes to, sort of, you know, uh, it defines a set of uh, uh, beliefs that uh, uh, that unites them. So really, um, ha um, Hamilton and Washington, at first apart, mm. then together, are having very similar reactions to the post-war political mm -hmm. situation and have very, very similar diagnosis in terms of the need yeah. um, to um, revise or even replace the Articles of Confederation and to establish a much stronger uh, government. So uh, Hamilton, he wasn't the only one, but I think that Hamilton was uh, very important in terms of coaxing Washington back out of retirement, um, of beginning to sort of tutor him in the constitutional issues, which Hamilton did along with uh, Madison and Knox. Okay, they're all sending him uh, memos, mm -hmm. um, beginning to brief him uh, for the Constitutional Convention, but also 
uh, convincing Washington that um, the American Revolution is incomplete uh, without the Constitutional Convention. Then I would convince him that the Constitutional Convention was incomplete without the creation <laughs> of the federal government with yeah. Washington as, uh, as, as, mm -hmm. as, as president. And so, yeah. and so actually when they come back together at the Constitutional Convention, the personal feeling between the two men seems to have warmed up again. I think the fact that uh, Washington was so eager to you know, have Hamilton come back, which he did, of course Hamilton was the uh, only one from New York who signed the document, um, that Washington uh, saw them as kindred spirits in terms of these constitutional mm -hmm. um, uh, issues. So really, at, you know, at that point, from the lead up to the Constitutional Convention, and beyond, they really never lose contact with each other again, and mm. um, it the relationship only grows yeah. uh, broader and uh, deeper as time uh, time goes on. Well, Ham Hamilton's uh, reputation uh, uh, preceded him even before uh, January 1777, which is when uh, notice was sent out uh, for Hamilton to contact uh, Washington about uh, being aide de camp. Um, Hamilton had already distinguished himself the Battle of White Plains, um, cr crossing of uh, uh, New Jersey. Um, Hamilton had fought at the battles of uh, Trenton and Princeton in both places where he had really stood out. And um, he had already rebuffed invitations from Alexander McDougall Mm. And Nathaniel Green and Lord Sterling to join their mm. staffs. Uh, so Hamilton was a famous holdout that mm. this boy wonder of the Continental Army mm. uh, had already declined to be on the staffs of uh, three uh, people. I guess Washington uh, figured correctly, as it turned out, that an invitation from him <laughs> would be irresistible. But Hamilton had this unusual combination of gifts, because on the other, the one hand, um, he was very um, well versed in military lore. He was always something of a daredevil. He was very fearless in battle throughout his life. He was physically a uh, fearless uh, personality. Um, but he was also uh, uh, smart. He had not completed his college education at, uh, at, at King's, but his intellectual reputation uh, preceded him, and so um, you know Washington during the uh, uh, the revolution was feeling quite oppressed by the weight of the correspondence that he had to uh, handle. Um, he was in a very unenviable situation. He had uh, he was serving fourteen political masters, thirteen state governors, and the Continental Congress, and so his correspondence is. Mm immense, and like any general, he wanted to be able to concentrate on military matters <laughs> rather than mm -hmm. writing mm -hmm. these endless letters. But the endless letters were, were necessary because he was short of um, uh, men and gunpowder, shoes, clothing, blankets, food, uh, everything. So it was like eight and a half years of badgering uh, people to uh, contribute to the uh, to, to the cause. And um, Hamilton was uh, a, a superb letter writer. Um, the way that Washington worked with his aides is that Washington would give them what he called headings, mm -hmm. I guess what we would call topics, you know, or points to, to be covered. Uh, and, and he would give them to Hamilton early in the morning and then Hamilton would um, write uh, beautiful letters in response. And Hamilton was also good, not so much mimicking Washington's voice, although so there was a little bit of uh, that, but he always, the letters feel um, Washingtonian mm. rather than Hamiltonian, because mm. like all good speech writers or all mm. good secretaries in that situation, he had a way of intuiting what mm. the boss mm. wanted in the um, uh, in the letter. That was probably also a little bit frustrating uh, for, for, for for Hamilton mm -hmm. uh, because he um, you know had a large ego subordinating himself to someone else was um, uh, uncomfortable, and 
Yeah, actually, well, this of is all people to support yourself to, though. I mean, at, at that moment, Washington oh. is the the only guy he would have, I guess. Right? Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. you know, uh, uh, Hamilton, from the time that he was uh, a boy, had this obsession with military glory. Mm. Actually, the very first letter um, that uh, we have from uh, Hamilton when he was in early his early teens, and by mm. with Hamilton writing, "I wish there was a war, so that he mm. could prove himself." And mm. uh, Hamilton um, knew, and he was right about this that. Uh, post-war political glory would not go to the person who'd written the most mm. beautiful letters yeah. during the war, but to the battlefield. So is, is that the seed of their, you know, their, their his growing frustration in Washington? Absolutely, because he, he keeps yeah. asking Washington for uh, mm -hmm. field men. Mm -hmm. You know, another young um, uh, man would have been so pleased and flattered to be on Washington's uh, family that he would have asked for nothing more. But uh, Hamilton um, uh, had this vaulting ambition mm -hmm. uh, and was really intent before the war uh, ended of uh, distinguishing himself on the field of battle, which he did. But it's testimony to how much uh, Washington needed him, that Washington would not let him go. You know, also one thing that I discovered was very, very important in terms of their relationship uh, was that ha Hamilton was bilingual. Mm -hmm. uh, Hamilton's uh, mother was French Huguenot, and so Hamilton, you know, grew up not only with English but French. And um, as the French lines became so important, mm -hmm. it was no small uh, thing because Hamilton was handling all the correspondence with our French allies. And Hamilton's French was so good, it was very funny um, reading, for instance, uh, his uh, at times when Lafayette was away and they were exchanging letters. Um, um, Lafayette would write a letter to Hamilton uh, in French and it would be full of uh, spelling and grammatical errors. Mm. And then Hamilton would write back an absolutely faultless mm. letter in French to the Frenchman. His French was much better than, uh, than Lafayette's. Mm. So there were kind of all of these things that I think um, made it very difficult for Washington to let go of this young man who was sulking about the fact that he couldn't get <laughs> A field command, but Washington made the uh, the right decision that uh, Hamilton um, was um, probably more valuable behind a desk <laughs> than he was on the field of battle. But when he finally had his chance at uh, at Yorktown, he certainly did cover himself with glory, and it was very much the realization of this boyhood dream. I think what happens is yeah. that um, uh, Washington. Although, as time goes on, it's clear that his sympathies are much more with the Federalists than with the mm -hmm. Republicans or Jeffersonians uh, at the time. But Washington was a very good president in terms of encouraging a free interplay of ideas within the, uh, the, uh, the, the government. And so he genuinely wants different uh, voices. He uses the same... Uh, style of governance actually that he uses as a general in terms of canvassing opinion. Mm -hmm. He would ask people and then he would kind of very uh, slowly ponder. You know, Hamilton <laughs> said he uh, ponders slowly, what was the line? Ponders slowly, ponders surely. Yeah. Uh, and that was uh, Washington's uh, style. And even when uh, Hamilton and Jefferson starts feuding, instead of wanting a unified or monolithic voice whose administration. Um, he does want to have these differences of opinion mm. going on. He's very you know, upset um, by the feud, and he's very upset when Jefferson uh, leaves. You know, a modern president might uh, react and say, he's not a member of the team, mm. and we have to get uh, rid of him. He's not sympathetic mm. uh, with it. And Washington was able to tolerate really quite a, a significant degree of mm. dissent from within his own administration. Mm. You know, I think that what happens, on the one hand, um, Madison fairly quickly uh, um, with the new government goes from being a trusted advisor uh, to Washington on political and constitutional questions it goes to being a, an apostate uh, and mm -hmm. begins to make speeches attacking Hamilton's uh, financial system. So it's really um, uh, Madison who begins to exile himself mm -hmm. from Washington's affection. It was really Madison who was initiating that, not mm -hmm. uh, uh, Washington.
Um, so Washington starts feeling a sense of betrayal with, with Madison. And then again, Washington doesn't uh, realize at first the extent to which Jefferson, the Secretary of State, is helping to orchestrate a lot of the congressional mm. and press attacks on the administration. But again, it's Jefferson who is pulling away from Mm -hmm. Washington. It's not Washington who is pushing him mm -hmm. away. And also I think that one reason that um, Washington and um, Hamilton uh, become so extraordinarily close is that um, Hamilton showed extraordinary loyalty to Washington. Um, um, was never scheming against Washington uh, behind his back, and Hamilton could scheme, but not against not against Washington. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Washington never had uh, cause to uh, doubt the personal and political loyalty of Alexander Hamilton right up till the day that he that he died. It was an um, extraordinarily yeah. uh, good relationship, and uh, Washington um, ended up feeling quite bitter. Towards Madison yeah. and Jefferson really didn't speak to them the last few years of his uh, life. And I was very struck when I came upon the story when I was doing the biography of uh, when Jefferson visited Mount Vernon mm. after Washington died. And Martha Washington said it was the second worst day of her life, the first day being when, when her husband yeah. died. But it's a very, very strong uh, uh, statement. I think he knew at the time because remember the the, the, the country was effectively bankrupt mm -hmm. at the time. You know we were in arrears um, not just um, on the um, principal but the interest of both the state mm -hmm. and local debt that had been used to finance the the, the war. So uh, immediately confronted George Washington the day that he took uh, office uh, were the um, economic and financial ones. Mm -hmm. You know, and I told you, one of the questions you had was about the choice of Hamilton as Treasury Secretary. Yeah. Um, you know, the story that I tell in the book, which I think was, came from Hamilton's son, was about Washington stopping off in Philadelphia on route to the inauguration, offering the job to Robert Morris. Right. That has the ring of truth. Uh, and then uh, Morris turning it down and recommending Hamilton and according to the story, um, um, Washington said, well, I knew that Mr. Hamilton was a young man of enormous talents, but I didn't realize that he has this financial knowledge and mm -hmm. Morris uh, said to him, to a mind like his, nothing is um, uh, amiss. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that Washington knew much more about Hamilton's um, yeah. views at that point. Uh, they were having dinner every day during the <laughs> Revolutionary War when all these topics yeah. uh, were being freely discussed. Also, and Washington couldn't have been oblivious of this, Hamilton, um, as they're going from camp to camp, Hamilton is lugging all of these books about economics and finance. He's already boning up mm -hmm. <laughs> to be Treasury Secretary. And he's writing letters and uh, essays and very much kind of the Hamiltonian system was already foreshadowed mm -hmm. in letters that he was writing back during the Revolutionary War. So Washington must have had some uh, inkling of this, but I would love to have had mm. even kind of, you know, better right. information that moment mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in, in, in the book. The only name that I was able to come up with in terms of other people being considered was, was uh, Robert Morris, and that would be completely uh, predictable since he'd been the chief mm -hmm. yeah. financier.
Well, first of all, you know, in, uh, in 1798, when um, Adams pretty much drafted Washington uh, to become the general of this uh, new provisional army, uh, Washington was uh, 66 years old, uh, quite infirm. You know, we know from the Gilbert Stuart photo, uh, no, as far as Gilbert Stuart paintings, of uh, just a few years earlier that Washington had become this stiff and craggy person who aged considerably. He doesn't, when you look at you know, the, the famous standing portrait, uh, Washington doesn't look like somebody who would get, go out and take the, take the battlefield as mm. uh, the general. And I think that he uh, realized that probably this was physically beyond him. Most of George Washington's entire life, even every time he returns to his beloved member, <laughs> there's another crisis and he's pulled back into the, mm. into the maelstrom. And so I think that what he does in that situation, Washington never felt that he could say no to the call of his country in a situation uh, like that. Uh, on the other hand, he clearly didn't relish it. And so what he, he, he did, understandably, is said to himself, OK, I'm going to accept this, but I'm going to define it in a minimal way rather than a, a you know, kind yeah. of maximalist um, way. Uh, 20 years before, he would have defined it in the maximalist mm, um, mm. Uh, way. Now he's doing, defining it in the minimalist uh, way. And so um, he lays down this uh, stipulation that he does not want to actually become the commander in the field until the war has actually started. Okay, think of that until the war is actually yeah. started. It means I think the provisional army is going to be about 10,000 men. Uh, so, who was going to recruit and train and equip this entire mm. army? It would have to be someone extraordinarily capable mm. uh, to do it. And Washington was not prepared to do that himself. He was prepared to, as it were, it was sort of like the batter who comes up, you know, the pinch hitter <laughs> with bases loaded with two outs in the night. He was ready to do that, you know, but um, a lot of the uh, hard work of actually forging an, an mm -hmm. army would be done by the number two, the so-called mm -hmm. Inspector General. Mm -hmm. And that was Hamilton. And, and, and Hamilton, he just felt that Hamilton um, was uh, more capable of doing that mm. uh, than, um, than Henry Knox. Hamilton actually had probably a more rounded sense of uh, an army. Remember Knox, mm -hmm. been head mm -hmm. of artillery? Uh, Hamilton was aide-de-camp, was Washington's uh, military secretary. Mm. But if you look at a lot of those um, Revolutionary War uh, councils, um, Hamilton was there. Mm -hmm. He was colonel, you know, but the other ten people in the room were, were, were general. So he was in on all the major yeah. strategy. Uh, discussions. I think also being on Washington's uh, staff, um, uh, Hamilton had a kind of nuts and bolts yeah. sense because he was involved uh, with all you know, the correspondence with the Congress uh, in terms of um, all of the kind of commissary and quartermaster matters of creating an army, feeding them, clothing them, housing them, all of this, and training them, <clears throat> which I don't know that Knox would have uh, I uh, had that, and there have kind of been, been other things that happened with uh, uh, Henry Knox that would have made um, uh, Washington and also Hamilton mm. uh, reluctant to um, bring him uh, back. But, um, you know, so Hamilton becomes the Inspector General. Hamilton becomes Major General. People don't realize that Alexander Hamilton ended up Major mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, General, but of course it was, as we all know, waving a, r a red flag <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> in mm -hmm. front of <laughs> President uh, <laughs> Adams. Yeah, yeah. And the result was uh, explosive and unfortunate all around. Uh, in Wa but Washington must have been uh, relieved that he never actually had to come out. You know, just one, one last thing on that point. Yeah. In their letters um, about uh, a possible war with France, which they took seriously, they actually took seriously the idea of a French invasion, and they discussed what form it would take. And they felt that when the French uh, landed, it, it wouldn't be like the British strategy where you occupy a few coastal cities. Uh, th that would be very rapid and very mobile, and they would start to invade the interior. Mm. And they would need a you know, fast-moving uh, army in response. And uh, Washington didn't feel that he had the reflexes mm. at that age in order to um, uh, be the general for that kind of fast-moving mm -hmm. campaign. I think it probably would have... Um, uh, e even physically beyond his capacity.
You know, I feel very uh, humble about this. I feel that mm. if I uh, at all saw you know farther than other biographers, it was because I was standing on the shoulders yeah. of this extraordinary uh, team of uh, editors uh, down at uh, Charlottesville, and that was actually one of the reasons that I did the book mm. because the old edition uh, that had formed the basis for you know Freeman, Flexner, and mm -hmm. that generation yeah, of right. um, historians. It's really very limited. I have it in, in, the, in the bedroom. I think it was 17 volumes, mm -hmm. very large print, very wide uh, margins. So by the time I started the Washington biography, I think about 60 of the projected 90 plus yeah. volumes you know, had yeah. been published. So I said to myself, do I want to wait until you know, all 90 plus volumes were, were published? I thought that was, given my age, tempting fate uh, to, to do that. But I thought that there was already enough on the record. Undoubtedly, when all of the 90 plus have been finished, someone will come you know, along and try another uh, synthesis. But it was probably the single most frequently asked question that I got when I was working on, on the book. People would say, is there anything mm new left to say. And mm. I would say to people, the work is just beginning mm. now. Mm. Um, we actually uh, know so much more about George Washington than his own contemporaries. I dare say mm. we know more about George mm. Washington than Martha did, because there are moments um, where his life is so minutely documented in those uh, volumes. You can feel on certain days that on an hour-to-hour -hour basis, you're following him around Mount Vernon, or on an hour-to-hour -hour basis, you're following him through a series of meetings with his cabinet uh, secretaries and uh, visiting dignitaries. It's astonished. And uh, Washington was very thorough, very meticulous. He was a consummate record keeper, God bless him, and not only recorded everything, sometimes rather surprising, uh, the things that uh, he would um, uh, record. But he had a great regard for um, the paper trail that he was uh, creating. I was very fascinated mm -hmm. that during the, the Revolutionary War that he creates a staff of people and gets a special appropriation mm -hmm. to, to create this beautiful mm -hmm. uh, edition of his uh, wartime letters and then took great uh, care in terms of transporting them back to Mount Vernon. Of course, you know this very much better than I do. He even thought of creating a house, you know, library. Could have been the first presidential library on the estate. So he's tending the documentary yeah. record as if he knew that, you know, I was going to come along and you know, <laughs> dozens of other biographers were going to come along and be yeah, the, coming through. The egomaniacal version. That's coming right. through all of these, you know, uh, uh, things. You, you feel that he is, um, you feel that uh, it was Washington himself who spread a banquet table of documents that all of us have been feasting on, yeah. you know, for yeah. a great many years. But, you know, he then, he, when he sat down and wrote this letter um, to his father-in-law, uh, he described what it was like working for, for Washington. Yeah. And he describes a Washington as very moody and temperamental mm. and says, um, the great man and I have come to an open rupture. He shall for once at least repent his ill humor. Now, I had never encountered George Washington in that mode. You know, and far from being disappointed by that, I actually was relieved. It suddenly humanized him. He mm -hmm. came alive for me in that moment, seeing him, not only in that letter, but other letters that Hamilton wrote uh, during the, um, uh, the, the, the war, mm -hmm. uh, actually um, gave it an immediacy to Washington, you know, that I hadn't mm -hmm. uh, experienced uh, before. You know, they say that uh, no, no man is a, is a hero to his valet. <laughs> and Washington, uh, during the Revolutionary War, was working under excruciating uh, pressure. Yeah. And I think that precisely because he had such immense self-control and he had this enormous image to live up to, he blew off steam in private, and mm -hmm. Hamilton saw that. I think also Washington's nature was that, um, it was why Washington did so well in life. Washington was a real perfectionist. He mm -hmm. was very...
uh, whether it was at Mount Vernon or you know in the federal government, he was very exacting mm. and demanding in terms of what he wanted and demanded very very high performance uh, from uh, people. So he was a very hard charging um, boss. Um, not at all the easygoing, uh, soft shoe boss that yeah. people had uh, imagined. And I, but I could remember that moment when I read that letter. Yeah. Uh, I felt that there was a George Washington that had not been captured. And I wondered, because Hamilton was very good at penning word portraits of people. He was very perceptive and he was a good enough writer that he could really uh, make uh, characters come mm. alive. So that for me, you know, that was the keyhole through which I mm. began to spy a portrait of Washington uh, that had not been uh, done before. Mm. And I think what happens with Washington, you know, because we all love and revere Washington so much, uh, both uh, then and now there's a, an almost automatic tendency to try to um, uh, wipe away the blemishes yeah. or look the other uh, way. And I feel that... He that gets the benefit of the doubt. He gets the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. And unfortunately that's done him a terrible mm. disservice mm. because it's turned him into uh, a somewhat unreal character mm. in the American mm -hmm. yeah. imagination when he was all too real. And I felt that the um, you know, the flaws in his uh, character, to my mind, instead of detracting from his greatness, actually enhanced yeah. the greatness because you realize what he had to overcome emotionally to be George Washington. The country was looking to him for a kind of perfection. He had ordinary human flaws and he was always kind of caught in the conflict between yeah. those two uh, things. So that was really the starting point of that uh, book. And of course, when I was doing, uh, uh, Hamilton was great fun to write about because he was on the one hand so brilliant and on the other hand mm. uh, so uh, flawed, uh, that the more I studied Hamilton, um, more I admired Hamilton, but the more I revered Washington. And I can remember when I was working on the Hamilton biography, I would say to people, Hamilton is the, uh, subject of my biography, but Washington is the hero of the uh, <laughs> of, of the biography. Yes. You know, Washington yeah. always does the right thing. Hamilton, yeah. most of the time, <laughs> does the right thing. In 2009, I was walking one day in the neighborhood, and I ran into my friend Gara, whose daughter had gone to Wesleyan with uh, Lin Manuel Miranda, and um, Lin Manuel was starring in his first show called In the Heights. And he told me that uh, Lynn Manuel had read my Hamilton book and uh, it made an enormous impression on him and he wanted to, to meet me. So I went to a matinee of um, In the Heights one Sunday and he invited me backstage and I said to him, so I gather my book made an impression on you. And he said, Ron, as I, I was reading it on vacation in Mexico uh, and as I was reading it, hip hop songs started rising off the page. So I said, "Really? <laughs> uh, this is not a." That wasn't what you were going for. This was not a. This is not a typical reaction to one of my uh, books. And he asked me on the spot to be the historical consultant. Uh, and so I said to him, "You mean you want me to tell you when something is wrong?" And he said, "Yes." He said, "I want historians to take this seriously," mm -hmm. which I think they they are. So that launched what has uh, been an amazing six-year uh, mm. process working with uh, him. And, you know, in the early period, we would have lunch and discuss Hamilton psychology, mm. relationships. Uh, he would send me uh, via email every month one or two songs. I would just hear Lynn at the keyboard uh, playing it. And mm. But then what happened, uh, once it started to go into various um, rehearsals and workshop productions, he would keep bringing me back in, and then I would, I would have the uh, opportunity uh, afterwards to sit down for an hour or two and really uh, give him my uh, uh, comments. And the comments, uh, some of the comments were, um, if I thought something was factually uh, incorrect, although I have to say he's very well read, uh, and he was um, almost always aware when he was departing from right, the, uh, right. the fact. But he, you know, he, had a, he had a sound dramatic reason. I think that um, I'm not sure that um, 
kind of put this. I, I think that there probably are a lot of historians and biographers who would not be entirely comfortable doing this uh, because you have to have some flexibility mm. uh, in terms of the requirements of uh, uh, a show. I mean, here, you know, we were going from an 800 page book to a two and a half hour yeah. uh, musical, and my involvement uh, with the show made me realize. Uh, History is long, messy, and complicated. <laughs> yes. yes. You know, there's one thing that we all learn as historians is um, how difficult it is to generalize. The more you know, the more, uh, the more yeah. difficult it is to simplify some of this. So well, I've been telling them in Mount Vernon as yeah. I've been there. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> you know, a two and a half hour show yeah. um, has to be um, short and tight and, uh, you know, very. Um, uh, coherent, mm. and so he would always have, I thought, a, a very plausible mm. um, explanation of why he had changed something. I mean, I can just give you one, because uh, it comes right at the beginning of the show, um, that um, the show begins right at the start of the American Revolution, and he has uh, John Lawrence and uh, Lafayette in New York. Um, a year or two before he actually meets them. So I said to him, Lynn, you know, you know he, mm -hmm. this is 1775, 1776, but they didn't, you know, meet Hamilton until 1777. Uh, but he wanted to, um, one of Hamilton's first friends when he came to New York was a tailor named Hercules Mulligan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think Lynn found the name irresistible. <laughs> uh, and Lynn wanted to start um, a series of quartets that run through the first act of Hamilton with his friends Mulligan. Lawrence and uh, uh, Lafayette, which means that with Lawrence and Lafayette, he has to introduce them, you know, mm -hmm. a little bit earlier than they mm -hmm. appear. So, um, uh, you know, there are moments where you have to scramble the time sequence yeah. a little bit. There are moments where you sort of have to collapse, you know, mm -hmm. different events uh, uh, together. And so, you know, I was always kind of feeling my way, uh, trying to figure out um, how does one strike the right balance between the historical yeah. accuracy and a tightly constructed mm -hmm. show? You know, and I hope people who see it, particularly uh, historians and biographers, will feel that we made the right, yeah. right decisions in uh, in doing it. So far, actually, we've gotten very, very good. The reactions. reviews have been really and superlative. Um, superlative, and and the reactions, you know, from yeah. Rick I mean, people yeah. um, who know, uh, know the story, yeah. you know, know the history, have come in have been, um, I think, amazed at how much accurate uh, history is packed into this uh, uh, show. I, I think that has real integrity, and I think that uh, Lynn manuel showed real strength in terms of uh, having a historian hanging around on the fringes of this conversation. I mean, usually someone creating a Broadway show, show or a Hollywood uh, movie, the last person they want <laughs> Yeah. around <coughs> is someone who's going to tell them this didn't actually happen. Yet. Right, they want them there to tell them what buttons people should have on their shirts, but yeah. not the actual story. Yeah, and and, and, yeah. and he did, and this, this was yeah. absolutely delightful for me because um, we did, uh, our discussions were more than uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, accuracy. Yeah. Uh, we discussed the characters, the uh, relationships, and really the entire dramatic trajectory. Yeah of uh, Hamilton's um, uh, life, and uh, it was fascinating for me, as I you know, mentioned earlier, he said to me one day early on, would Washington have uh, seen Hamilton as a younger version of himself? Mm. And um, I said yes, and uh, Lynn responded to that very powerfully, and you'll see he created a couple of beautiful mm. songs mm. where uh, Washington sings to Hamilton, let me tell you what I wish I'd known when I was a younger man. And he starts talking about, he has a name for it, Necessity, but he's clearly hmm. uh, wow. you know, talking about the, the Jumonville incident and Fort Necessity and the mistakes that he made hmm. as a that's younger Yeah, that's really man. Neat. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, and it's accurate. Yeah. I remember the first show that I ever saw about the Founding Fathers was called 1776. Yeah, another musical. Yeah, and I, you know, and I loved it. It was yeah, delightful, but it was, it was a quaint <laughs> period piece. It was um, uh, a bunch of late middle-aged white males, you know, with <laughs> wigs and buckle shoes. Uh, okay, this is a show about the Founding Fathers where uh, probably three quarters of the people in the cast are um, black, Latino, Eurasian, biracial. Um, almost the entire cast is under 35. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is 
a very unusual case of a historical show that's simultaneously showing us who we were back then as a country and who we are mm. today. Yeah. So it's kind of, it has a way of being both about the 18th century and the early 21st century, and even what um, Lynn has done with the, uh, the, the, the lyrics, he's created an idiom uh, that is um, a blend of uh, standard uh, 18th century speech and early 21st century slang. Mm. And it all comes out sounding of a piece. Have, have you seen, did you see the... the I've, the, the, I've seen he clips of it on YouTube and that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, I that kind of yeah, you know, give yeah. you a sense of the way that he blends it. Yeah, and then even kind of musically, the mm. sounds blend the 18th century and uh, 21st um, uh, mm -hmm. century. Um, and so, you know, this young, largely um, uh, black and Latino cast has a very, very special feel for um, the early years of the Republic. Mm. And I think that uh, it's because the show itself is very much cast Hamilton as a um, classic immigrant, uh, mm. as an mm. outsider, you know, of the American Revolution. Uh, being created by these people who felt outsiders mm. and who became insiders yeah, in the course the of creating this yeah. this new uh, mm. uh, country. And so it has the, the energy and the fervor and the passion um, of the period. And it comes closer than anything I've seen either on stage or screen to capturing that, mm. um, that mood. It really is quite extraordinary. Um, I, think, I think people are loving it because um, Manuel has done something extraordinary. He's made American history hip and cool mm. and erudite at the same time. Mm. And only he could have uh, done it. Because very, very often, without mentioning any specific examples, when people, you know, stage or screen, uh, do the uh, founding era, yeah. they kind of dumb it down. They seem to start out with the um, mm. assumption that this is boring, dated stuff. No one's really interested in this stuff. So we better have a lot of action. We better have a lot of cannons, you know, booming and muskets, you know, firing. We better try to, you know, spice it up with some sex. Um, but there's an underlying assumption that the, the contemporary audience is going to find boring. Uh, Lynn, instead of finding the history constraining, he finds the history liberating. Mm. He finds it exciting. Mm -hmm. And the more deeply he gets into the history, that the more dramatic it's going to be. And I think the audience feels that. Mm. So this is like the um, uh, history class of a lifetime, mm. uh, seeing this, uh, this show. And uh, we've had kids as young as 10 and 11 come down to see the show and just absolutely uh, adore it. And at the same time, you know, highly, you know, literate. Uh, adults have, have seen it and took uh, pleasure. They're kind of, you know, if you don't know anything about the period, you'll learn an enormous amount. If you do know a lot about the period, mm. uh, you'll pick up a lot of in-jokes. Mm. Uh, I, I could just give one, there's one moment Hamilton's working on his financial plan, and uh, uh, his wife, Eliza, is trying to get him to, you know, take a rest and um, go away to the country. And so, mm. um, Eliza and Hamilton and Hamilton's sister Angelica. There's and, and Eliza turns to Angelica and says, "Angelica, you know, tell tell my husband that John Adams spends the summers with his family." And then Hamilton says to Angelica, "Angelica, tell my wife that John Adams doesn't have a real job anyway."